was uh, quite a discussion so far. We want to turn it to you and to, uh, to have contributions from the floor. We have heard quite a lot of evidence from uh, a number of countries in terms of uh, particular abortion-related, um, the impact of legal restrictions, but also restrictive policies on uh, mortality, on unsafe abortion. Uh, we've heard a great deal about uh, human rights law and how human rights law applies to uh, issues of abortion. And we've heard a lot about uh, uh, the intersection between abortion rights and the internet. And, and there is a fair bit there. There's a fair bit of evidence. There's a fair bit of uh, jurisprudence there. Um, and yet, uh, and we've heard this from the Special Rapporteurs as well, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health um, a few years ago, and then a landmark report on criminalization and sexual reproductive health, calling um, very clearly for the decriminalization of abortion globally. Um, much of this seems to fall on deaf ears. So what I'd like to pose to all of you and to our panelists as, a, as an initial question from, from me as the uh, moderator is, is what are the what are next steps for the council on this issue? Why why is it that we um, why is it that special rapporteurs reports that all this evidence that all this jur jurisprudence seems to fall into a vacuum at the intergovernmental level? Um, and what are the next steps to change that? So, are there other questions or comments from the floor? Um, in Valentina's presentation, right at the end, you gave a positive example of Mexico City. And I was wondering if the panelists could speak a little bit to any other uh, positive examples of where you see uh, decriminalization, enhancing access to legal abortion as something that reduces stigma, enhances enjoyment of rights, and uh, maybe improves health outcomes as well. So if you could speak a little bit to some of those uh, Positive example, if you have that, I think it's so Thanks. What is the aspiration that you all have for the Human Rights Council? Right? Let me show you. Let's start with a round of uh, answers. Do we want to do any of the other papers? Okay. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. 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 In terms of positive examples, um, I'm not sure if this exactly answers your question, but I think something that we've seen as really positive, um, which is quite a recent development, is um, I mentioned in my presentation uh, two cases that the center had litigated against Peru, one uh, KL and the Human Rights Committee and the other LC in CEDAW. And um, you know, Peru has a, a, a long history of uh, certain um, exceptions to access to abortion, um, but generally um, it being criminalized. And um, both of those cases, the, both the Human Rights Committee and CEDAW Committee, called on Peru to uh, better clarify those cases in which abortion uh, needs to actually be uh, legal and accessible. And, uh, that's because the reality uh, in Peru, and I think in a lot of the countries in which we work, is that although abortion may be uh, legal in law, um, generally or in some instances, the reality and what we've been talking about today because of stigma, because of lack of clarity around um, when abortion is legal, it, in reality is not accessible. So recently, um, and in follow-up to the dis to advocacy around implementation of these decisions, Peru has recently adopted guidelines on access to safe and, and legal abortion in Peru. And that we see is a really important step forward to allowing um, reproductive health care providers to um, understand when they are able to provide this service. And one, although incremental, but one important and incremental step in um, addressing criminalization and stigma in Peru. Um, and so I think <coughs> overall the, the examples that we've seen are, are, are examples such as that. Um, but also, um, I don't think there are any left, but I, I brought, um, the center develops a global, a world abortion laws map, um, which we update every year. And actually this year in September, uh, we will, we're launching a complete sort of revamp of that world abortion laws map, and um, that 
map will show that there are actually, despite, um, <laughs> I think some of us feel that maybe in political spaces it, it feels like things um, might not be getting better, but in fact what our map shows is that laws overall are becoming more progressive um, <coughs> around access to abortion globally, in particular in, in Latin America, but, but also um, other regions as well. And you can actually look at every country in the world and what their law is and how it's changed uh, since we began mapping what their national law was, I believe, in, in 2009. Um, so that's on uh, worldabortionlaws.org. Um, so that's another place where, and then again in September, it'll be, um, uh, it's in September, on September 18th, we will be launching um, the, the brand new edition of that, and, and you can have quite a few examples to see how laws have come out. So, uh, I don't have a, a specific example, per se, but I, I'd like to highlight uh, at least uh, the government, uh, what the government has taken as a step to address the issue of unsafe abortion and the complications resulting from unsafe abortion. Uh, after a study that realized that half, more than half of uh, the uh, Complications that lead to maternal mortality as a result of unsafe abortion. They've um, they embarked on a the program to, uh, to, uh, to provide countrywide uh, post abortion care treatment. Uh, well, that one does not really address uh, the stigma itself from the, the from society and from the health providers, but um, it somehow saves life in that people who are able to uh, to be strong and face the stigmatization and go to health centers and get uh, treatment, then their lives are saved in that way. So uh, that program, in a way, is uh, one of the success stories that the government is really trying to, at least to save the life of women who are uh, face all the great serious complications that may result into them. Um, also, if I can say a bit about the, the next steps, um, to me, I always feel like it's uh, like the focus is not truly just be on the, on the state, but the move of uh, restrictive laws to some extent is, is, a, is, a, is a first step. Because in Rwanda, they're standing with you, for example, realize that. Uh, when the women who go to prison usually they are reported either by the, the neighbors or their friends or the people they know about, not by themselves. So somehow uh, it's the fear of people to be incriminated uh, uh, or to be part of the, the crime of abortion the that they have to report these cases. So uh, when uh, there are no laws that, that people are supposed to be to be criminals because of being associated with some of us and abortion, uh, then at least that would be a first step to uh, address the right to uh, 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 to, uh, uh, yeah, tackling the issue of stigma in the community. <coughs> so the laws, restrictive laws, uh, uh, I see them as the first step that should really be addressed and should, should really be pushed for by the, the, the Human Rights Council. Well, unfortunately, we only have that like, good example in Mexico, the one in Mexico City, but I would like to point out that three out of 10 women who undergo an abortion in Mexico City come from outside of the city, from other states. And there are some civil society organizations who fund women with scarce resources, they travel and they stay in Mexico City so they can have a legal abortion and a safe abortion. Um, this is one. <coughs> um, one thing the council could do is to highlight the intersecting nature of women's rights. Um, sexually reproductive health rights are related to many aspects of the council's work and also intersect with other rights like the right to privacy and freedom of expression. We also really want to emphasize the right to access information related to women's sexual and reproductive choices. Because in many countries, not only is abortion banned, but it's also illegal. And what information does is it gives women, it gives women, it gives women options and choices. Um, and that really is really key. Just to give one example, um, is of Tashi in India, who's been running a hotline for the last 10 years on reproductive rights. And those kinds of examples, I think, are positive examples about why this is important. 